Uju, Thomas and Dijini Kaas, Berlin, Indonjiba, Winnipeg, and Ayan Nongom. I've just greeted you, introduced my name, and told you where I'm from and where I live now in Ojibwe, a language of one of the first peoples on the territory I now call home. I am Thomas Falkenberg, the acting dean of the Faculty of Education, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Joan Irvin Lecture on Teacher Education. Well, in these virtual times, it is difficult to locate where exactly today's event takes place. The physical campuses of the University of Manitoba are located on the original lands of Anishinaabek, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dana peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The University of Manitoba respects the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Such land acknowledgements at the beginning of public events have become more and more common practice. So for instance, at the Prairie Theatre Exchange, PTE, one of the two big theaters in Winnipeg where a land acknowledgement is made before every performance. For land acknowledgements not to become routine and thus lose the moral implications for us settler folks, we need to attend to them with concern and moral commitment. PTE provides an example of putting life into one's land acknowledgement. Thomas Morgan Jones, a theater's artistic director, announced a few seasons back that the theater commits every season to staging at least one play that is written by an indigenous playwright. Others do their part and invite my and I invite my fellow settler colleagues in this webinar to think of and engage in an activity, small or large, that is within your personal or professional scope of action an activity in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration with indigenous people and peoples. Before we begin tonight's lecture, I would like to introduce you to the woman for whom this lecture series is named, Joan Irvin. If we were physically together in this same space, we would now introduce, I would now introduce you to Joan, but under the given circumstances, I can only tell you that Joan is in the audience of this webinar. Welcome, Joan. I'm so pleased that you are able to join us tonight. While I, while I attended previous Joan Irvin lectures, I've never made the acquaintance of Joan, so I'm grateful to the previous Dean of Education, David Manzik, for helping me prepare this introduction of Joan. Joan was born in Winnipeg and educated at the University of Manitoba. She has made an enormous contribution to the development of this province, initially as a school teacher in rural Manitoba, but primarily as a teacher educator for some 30 years. She became a member of the staff at the Manitoba Teachers College in 1964 and joined the Faculty of Education at the University of Manitoba the next year when the college was closed and its staff was integrated with the university. One would not be far off the mark in calling her the Manitoba teacher educator of her time. Certainly the honors she has accumulated attest to the esteem in which she is held. The Saunders and Stanton Awards for excellence in teaching at this university, the Life Membership Award uh, by the Manitoba Teacher Society on the occasion of her retirement, the John M. Brown Award for her outstanding contribution to teacher education, awarded to her by the Alumni Association of the Faculty of Education, the Excellence in Post-Secondary Teaching Award presented to her by the Manitoba Chapter of the Canadian College of Teachers, and perhaps an award that is particularly dear to her, the name, naming of a day in her honor by the staff and students at Lord Roberts School in Winnipeg in 1979. On the occasion of her retirement in 1965, her friends and admirers established a Joan Irvin bursary in her honor. After her retirement, Joan committed extensive effort to the development of our faculty's early years program, 
engaged with faculty members in challenging discussions, worked with students to further their understanding of classroom issues, and helped the faculty build closer ties with schools. Miigwech, Joan. Yeah, before I turn it over to my colleague, Melanie Jensen, I want to draw your attention to the remaining two lectures in the Dean's Distinguished Lecture Series that this year contributes to our faculty's truth and reconciliation work. The next webinar lecture is held on April 8th, 6 p.m. Sheila Kodnik and Taima, Taima uh, Merck Pickering will present on decolonizing and indigenizing education in Canada. On May 3rd, 7 p.m., Blair Stonechild will present on Indigenous spirituality under the title of Loss of Indigenous Eden, Insights for Educators. You can find more information on these events on the Faculty of Education's Eventbrite page or by going to the faculty's homepage and clicking on, on the faculty's event link. A note for tonight's lecture, this webinar is recorded and will be posted online for later viewing. Those who registered for this lecture will receive notification when this webinar is posted. Misa Gominik va kidiro yan miigwech. I now turn it over to my colleague Melanie Jensen, who will introduce tonight's speaker. Melanie. Thank you, Thomas. Welcome, everybody. My name is Melanie Jansen. It's my pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker for tonight, Dr. Jan Hare. Dr. Jan Hare is an Anishinaabe scholar and educator from the Chiking First Nation in Northern Ontario. She is currently a professor and an associate dean for Indigenous Education in the Faculty of Education at the University of British Columbia. Dr. Hare is also the director of NITEP, the faculty's Indigenous teacher education program. Dr. Hare has been awarded a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Pedagogy, which considers the complex processes of teaching from Indigenous knowledge frameworks by focusing on instructor knowledge, beliefs, and practices from across different disciplines in higher education. Dr. Hare led the development of the massive open online course, also called a MOOC, called Reconciliation Through Indigenous Education, which is free and openly available online through UBC. We are also thrilled at the recent announcement and extend our congratulations to Dr. Jan Hare, who has just been appointed the Dean Pro Tem of the UBC Faculty of Education. Quite an accomplish accomplishment indeed. And tonight we have the great privilege of listening to Dr. Hare as she provides this year's Joan Irvin Lecture, Coyote Contemplates Reconciliation, Lessons for Teacher Education. After Dr. Hare's talk, we will have time for questions, and I ask that you please write your questions in the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen and not in the chat. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome a leader in teacher education, in Indigenous teacher education, a colleague and a friend, Dr. Jan Hare. Welcome, Jan. Hello, um, so I'm going to share my screen and I note uh, I'm not able to share until uh, I think somebody else is sharing right now. Okay. Here we go. Um, we got Melanie for that uh, introduction. So Bojo Ani, Janice Hare Deshniakas, Ejnishna Bekwe, Chiging, Nindojiba. I uh, just wanted to give uh, um, a greeting, a uh, greet to you in my language. And I have to say, Dr. Falkenberg, your Nishinaboen is uh, quite good. <laughs> um, so uh, also miigwech um, for your introduction as well. So I join you this evening from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. And I also acknowledge that U of M uh, is hosting us this evening and uh, appreciate the acknowledgement that uh, Dr. Falkenberg has provided uh, for us, acknowledging the lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oja Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homelands of the Métis Nation. I do also want to say miigwech, which is a thank you uh, for the invitation to speak with you tonight, and in particular gratitude to Dr. Joan Irvin, whose name Distinguished Lecture creates a forum uh, for university uh, and faculty of education in particular, and community to come together around educational themes of significance. And I'm very proud to be included and invited as a speaker in this annual lecture. 
So tonight uh, I speak about reconciliation and I believe the last time I was here in the Faculty uh, of Education at the U of M and that was around U of, uh, I think around 2017. And I was there at the invitation of Indigenous scholar and Canada Research Chair, Dr. Frank Deere. Uh, and I spoke as part of a panel on reconciliation. I believe Dwayne Donald, and, um, Dr. Donald and uh, Dr. Marie Batiste were uh, part of that. And at that time, uh, reconciliation was fast becoming a vehicle for uh, attention, expression, and an action, sorry, action. And in those initial conversations, I really believe that, uh, I, I, had, I believe that if reconciliation held the moment, it held promise. And uh, I was so much inspired by the work of the TRC that I developed a massive open online course, Reconciliation Through Indigenous Education, with, you know, really wanting others to deepen their understandings of Canada's colonial history and how an assimilationist uh, education produces different outcomes for Indigenous peoples. I wanted people to recognize the contributions uh, of Indigenous knowledges to teaching and learning, uh, help people rethink their relationship, maybe even reconcile that relationship uh, to land in place as this was another relationship for all of us uh, who are, you know, all of us um, entangled in settler colonialism. And finally, you know, to, to think about ways we can engage respectfully with Indigenous people. And since that time, I've really become, I've become persuaded that reconciliation enacted through teacher education programs may have raised awareness of settler colonial schooling and story. However, it simply hasn't done enough to challenge the normative structures of teacher education that include curriculum, programs and services um, and policies. While Indigenous education is a critical area of development in teacher education and reconciliation certainly as a framework has inspired positive changes, I contend that we need to rethink our collective responsibilities towards Indigenous education in ways that advance Indigenous focused educational opportunities that support sovereignty and improving the life worlds of Indigenous learners and communities. And I share this initial picture. Uh, this is a picture um, from the poll raising. This is a reconciliation poll uh, that was carved by Hard Haida artist James Hart. And it sits on the south end of our campus. And it's a, a, a representation of the uh, history of residential school <laughs> moving towards reconciliation. And what I, why I wanted to share this is you can see it. You might be able to see at the bottom the, a whole host of people who attended the poll raising itself. And, and to me, it's a demonstration of the many hands um, that it takes to bring reconciliation forward. Uh, oh, okay. There we go. So my teaching and research, um, my teaching and research are concerned with how classrooms and institutions can be inclusive of Indigenous knowledges and worldviews, especially as critiques of post-secondary education have established how commonly classroom, in, uh, classroom instruction operates as a colonized space in which Indigenous students experience racism and exclusion in it, the content and pedagogical processes uh, and classroom intera uh, interactions. And complementary to this uh, is my work in my role as Associate Dean of Indigenous Education, where I'm tasked with advancing Indigenous priorities across our Faculty of Education. And so I focus on teacher education uh, as a, a site of change given the urgent priorities of, and you know, if we think about in, uh, the priorities uh, within Indigenous education uh, and within faculties of education, you know, drawn to or raised for us, you know, curriculum reform that's happening in teacher education uh, across this country. Um, increasing recruitment, retention, and success for Indigenous learners. So how is it that we are uh, creating pathways uh, and new opportunities uh, for Indigenous students uh, in, uh, in education, as well as creating uh, accessible and relevant programs and services and creating respectful and uh, meaningful Indigenous uh, community engagement. 
So attention to these priorities have been established well before the findings of uh, the calls to action of the TRC. The Royal Commission on Indigenous Peoples or on Aboriginal Peoples was significant to um, providing recommendations that recognized the importance of local control of education and Indigenous engagement. And these were foundations of Indian control of Indian education. The, associate, uh, the Association of Canadian Deans of Education um, had developed a court on Indigenous education and that these also brought attention to these priorities and brought them into a national dialogue as it was stated that the Accord on Indigenous Education would guide program review and transporta uh, transportation, sorry, and transformation, um, working collaboratively to prioritize the educational purposes and values of Indigenous communities and people. And I'm quoting from that document. The accelerated trend towards reconciliation in faculties of education has since shifted its emphasis to Indigenous settler relations and less so to the ways institutions can be responsive to the aspirations of Indigenous learners and accountable to Indigenous communities. So Indigenous education priorities and teacher education might best be understood through the significant cultural being of the trickster. And I recognize the term trickster in itself is not inherently an Indigenous framing. Many cultures have this archetype character in their stories. So for this presentation, I draw on how Indigenous peoples have constructed the notion of the trickster in their own ways and in their own languages. Within this worldview, I consider the trickster, the transformer, the shapeshifter as a more than human figure in our stories. And so for those of you who might not be aware, the, this important cultural being comes by many names. They're known as Goose Lap if you visit the territories of the Mi'kmaq on the east coast uh, of Canada, Nanabojo among the Anishinaabe in Ontario or central Canada, Wasajizik adventuring among the Cree, Napi taking journey on the plains, sometimes colliding with Coyote who makes his appearance in, um, in the interior of BC and Raven, who takes form on the Northwest Coast. And of course, the trickster uh, as a being is mostly shaped by local languages, but the it's the ambiguity of this being um, that cap is captured in its multiple identities. So in drawing on the trickster for this presentation, I'm not trying to define the trickster as have anthropologists, historians, uh, or scholars of literary studies. Rather, I consider the trickster as an embodiment of Indigenous people's worldview known to us through our stories, our histories, our lands, and our learning traditions. And it's through the trickster, the, their deeds, the antics, and travels that we come to new understandings of the world around us. And so I want to explore how methodical the trickster can be in education and how these stories operate to teach us as well as shape our responsibilities towards Indigenous education priorities, such as the ones I raised in the previous slide. Indigenous stories, such as trickster stories, rely on specific strategies. And tonight I wanna to share with you three pedagogical strategies that bring to light how teacher education situated within Western institutions can be reconceptualized so they reflect Indigenous visions of what it means to serve Indigenous communities and learners. So at this point, I want to share with you the story, Coyote Takes Water from the Frog People. Because I think if we were to understand trickster strategies, then a trickster story might help us. Before I begin, I'm reminded by Stolo scholar, Dr. Joanne Archibald, who writes not only about the power of stories to heal and teach, but of the protocols associated with storytelling and trickster stories in particular, which includes reference to the cultural and historical specificity of the trickster figure, as well as locating the story in its territorial origin. So this is a, a Kalapua story from the indigenous peoples whose traditional homelands are on the Willamette uh, are in the Willamette Valley in Western Oregon of the United States. It's an oral story and it's been documented uh, by anthropologists Spiritos and Ortiz. It can be also be found on educational and cultural websites supported by indigenous communities and organizations and the Kalapua 
people themselves. So it's a public story. It's a indigenous story that is uh, public. There might be slight variations, certainly in the retellings, but with indigenous stories, it is the responsibility of reader and or reader and listener uh, to make meaning. And so it goes. Coyote was out hunting and he found a dead deer. One of the deer's rib bones looked like a big uh, denitalia shell, and a denitalia shell is something you might see now on um, traditional regalia at ceremony or, or celebration, such as a powwow. And Coyote picked, up, uh, picked it up and took it with him, and he went to see the frog people. The frog people had all the water. When anyone wanted to drink water, any water, to drink or to cook with or wash, they had to go and get it from the frog people. Coyote came up to the frog people. Hey, frog people, I have a big Danitalia shell here. I want a big drink of water and I want to drink it for a long time. Well, give us the shell, the frog people say, and you can drink all you want. Coyote gave them the shell and began drinking. Now the water was behind a large dam where Coyote drank. I'm going to keep my head down for a long time, said Coyote, because I'm really thirsty. Don't worry about me. Okay, we won't, said the frog people. Now Coyote began drinking and he drank for a long time. Finally, one of the frog people said, hey, Coyote, you sure, you are, you sure are drinking a lot of water. What are you doing that for? Well, Coyote brought his head up out of the water and he says, I'm thirsty. After a while, one of the frog people said, Coyote, you sure are drinking a lot. Maybe you better give us another shell. Well, just let me finish this drink, Coyote said, then putting his head back under the water. The frog people wondered how a person could drink so much water, and they didn't like this. They thought Coyote might be doing something. Well, Coyote was digging out under the dam all the time. He had his, had his head under the water. And when he finished, he stood up and said, mm, well, that was a good drink. That's just what I needed. And then all of a sudden the dam collapsed and all the water came out into the valley and made the creeks and the rivers and the waterfalls. And the frog people were very angry. You've taken all the water, Coyote. Well, it's not right that one people have all the water. Now it is where everyone can have it. Well, Coyote did that. Now everyone can go down to the river and get a drink of water or have some water to cook with or just to swim around. Now, given time, I would stop and let you make meaning for this from this story. Maybe asking you what comes to mind when you hear this story. Maybe reminding you of the purpose of our talk here tonight and how the story might relate to the context. Or I might ask you if you can relate to the experiences of Coyote or the frog people, maybe even the humans. I might even ask you how this story makes you feel, but time is not on my side. For me, this story brings to mind the enormous challenges Indigenous students face in their participation in mainstream post-secondary institutions. In their transitions to campus, they leave behind family and community and cultural commitments sometimes very large responsibilities. And for many, they may be the first in their families to attend a university uh, or college. Anishinaabe scholar Sheila Cote Meeks um, says uh, in, in her book, Colonized Classrooms, one of the greatest challenges confronted by Aboriginal people when they enter any classroom space is the longstanding and ongoing history of colonialism, oppression, and racism. So students, Indigenous students confront racism directed at them by their non-Indigenous student counterparts or their peers, or instructors who are complicit by perpetuating racist and colonial discourses and practices. The curriculum remains largely shaped by Eurocentric dominant theories and practices, which marginalize Indigenous knowledges and Indigenous student experiences. In fact, Indigenous programs situated in white mainstream programs can be constrained by larger systems of assimilation. Further, if financial resources and trusting relationships needed for Indigenous community uh, and university collaborations are lacking, Indigenous students are then put at risk for completion of their program. So I return to the story of Coyote, who breaks the social and physical boundaries of the dam created by the frog people. 
Indigenous students cross the social and physical confines that separate post-secondary institutions from Indigenous communities and cultures. Institutions that were not created for Indigenous people. And Sami uh, scholar Rona Kakonen argues that programs intended to bridge mainstream education with Indigenous cultures and communities ignore what she says are the ontological and epistemological differences. And so while offering support and assistance, place responsibilities solely on Indigenous students to succeed. So Coyote, who appears to be engaged in an act of self-interest by drinking up the water, is strategically breaking the dam in order to ensure that water is available for the people, the land, and the animals. And so like Coyote, Indigenous students are also confronting and breaking institutional barriers, using education as a tool for self-determination, nationhood, and the transformation of educational systems. Now, if we were only to focus on the foibles and successes of Coyote in the Kalapua story that I just shared, it might be reductive and perhaps limit the possibilities of Indigenous stories to help us fully understand Indigenous-focused opportunities as part of Western education systems. <laughs> Instead, I wish to focus on the way Coyote functions in the story, emphasizing three pedagogical strategies within Indigenous narratives to generate dialogue that contemplates the role of reconciliation as a framework for meaningful and sustainable change in higher education. And I will add that when uh, I was invited to give this presentation, um, uh, my conversations with Dr. Jensen were around starting to, uh, that the faculty in itself would be um, thinking its um, strat current uh, uh, strategic plan and, and thinking, rethinking uh, reconciliation. Well, maybe not rethinking reconciliation, but examining the role of reconciliation and where to now. So the first strategy that I turn to is the ability of this being to disrupt the social order of things. <clears throat> now using this technique, the, trans, uh, the trickster transforms present realities to create something more habitable. Anishinaabe scholar Ningagwadam James Sinclair tells us, his presence usually ensures that something interesting, divergent and potentially world altering will occur. So the trickster's tendency to disrupt usually means bridging stability with absurdity. And in doing so, trickster expands the limits of what is possible for listeners of these stories. In the coyote story, frog people think coyote is drinking up the water when really he's submerged for a long time with the goal of ensuring water can be shared among everybody. And what we can all appreciate about coyote and other tricksters is the ability to change reality by flouting the social conventions. So as trickster wanders through the landscape of higher education, trickster can manipulate and subvert the colonial world, helping us see new possibilities to foregrounding indigenous aims of sovereignty. Reconciliation as a framework for change has certainly inspired uh, formalized responses in post-secondary institutions that include strategic plans, task force recommendations, uh, symposia, uh, symbolic representations on campus, uh, Indigenous and community engagement initi initiatives, and professional development. And I had an opportunity today to wander uh, through U of M, the University of Manitoba's websites, to begin to look at Indigenous presence uh, on campus. And I share some of them here with you, which you are uh, likely many of you are familiar with. So teacher education programs embracing reconciliation have, have uh, introduced foundational coursework in education, have hired Indigenous faculty, and even created uh, positions such as an Associate Dean Indigenous Education, as well as developing new programs. Yet scholars and educators continue to scrutinize the concept of reconciliation, <laughs> drawing attention to the opportunities and limitations it creates for intervening on the curriculum and policies and practices of education. Instead, indigenization has become the new shiny object of focus uh, for Coyote, but also for higher education. The possibilities that indigenization holds for the trickster's approach for destabilizing the institution 
to reflect visions of what it means to serve Indigenous communities and learners is seen in what scholars Gaudry and Lorenz frame as decolonial indigenization, which is a dismantling of the university and building it back up again with, the ver with a very different role and purpose. <laughs> This form of indigenization is organized around two models that they present. And one is a treaty-based model of the university, uh, where it, um, which involves creating a dual, univer dual university structures that operate in parallel. So with the indigenous community alongside that of um, the university. And the other model they present is one of resurgence, a resurgence-based model that remakes colonial structures in a new image, uh, focused on rebuilding, rebuilding and strengthening Indigenous culture and knowledges and the political orders uh, of the institution. So according to Gaudry and Lorenz, both these models rely on processes built on consensus, meaningful, um, meaningful partnership and collaboration. And here's where the trickster might contemplate something different for teacher education. Rather than emphasize collaboration with Indigenous communities, the trickster advocates for co-construction as a means for advancing Indigenous priorities. And here I'm drawing from co-construction research scholarship to make the distinction between um, collaboration and co-construction. So through collaborative spaces, uh, though collaborative spaces, or sorry, yeah, though, though collaborative spaces are often considered democratic, uh, Indigenous people tend to be treated as informants rather than given voice and agency uh, and decision making, such as in a co-constructed um, uh, model or in, in a co-constructed educational initiatives. And whereas faculties of education may collaborate with Indigenous communities to achieve common goals, which is a, a, a parallel form, um, a, a, a parallel form, um, co-construction assumes uh, outcomes, metrics, and goals are established by Indigenous people. So co-construction involves building from the ground up with Indigenous people as a form of transportation, as a, as a form of transformation, instead of collaborating in the final chapters of initiatives, which is often a common critique uh, of higher uh, education's engagement with Indigenous people. Finally, uh, traces of Indigenous activism can be observed in co-construction processes, while collaboration is narrowly aimed towards problem solving. So if our role as faculties of education is to empower Indigenous learners and communities in their own journeys towards resurgence, to regain educational sovereignty, then we need to pay, then, then we need other ways of engaging with uh, Indigenous uh, people and communities in our work. The second pedagogy of the trickster relies on summoning our imagination. And this occurs through the trickster's wanderings, the ability to assume different forms and possessing human and more than human qualities. As the coyote story I shared demonstrates, the trickster often utilizes humor, self-mocking or absurdity to help teach us lessons. And a Shinabe writer, Gerald Bisner, takes issue with the reductive caricature of the trickster as a buffoon created by anthropologists who view the trickster simply as a source of entertainment. Rather, he suggests that the indigenous rather he suggests that indigenous interpretations of the trickster are culturally centered, communally grounded, and highly complex, as well as comedic. Uh, as Indigenous uh, scholar uh, Joanne Archibald describes, uh, trickster is someone who, quote, often gets into trouble ignoring the cultural rules and practices. At the same time, trickster has the ability to do good things for others, uh, to do good things for others and is given respect. Indigenous writers and scholars and storytellers surmise that the antics of the trickster are strategic and used to make people think shift ideas and generate new viewpoints. So I wanna share with you an example of this a trickster imaginative. So in my role um, uh, as associate dean, I participated in what I would think of as the co-construction of a master's of educational, uh, a master's of education initiative or program. And we partnered 
with an indigenous post-secondary institution in BC, the Nicola Valley Institute uh, of Technology. And so they approached the Faculty of Education then to offer uh, an MED program, which was really aimed at building capacity and, creden and credentials uh, for staff within uh, po indigenous post-secondary institutes in British Columbia. And so for us in the faculty, uh, co-constructing really brought uh, new ways of working together. Um, and uh, so I want to share with you some elements uh, of that process. And so in coming together, uh, you know, it, it was uh, the Nicola Valley Institute of uh, Technology, so our Indigenous partner, who really set the agenda of what uh, you know, what the goals and purposes of the masters uh, of education would be. And so it was, our, you know, our work to then find an appropriate master's uh, offering within our faculty that would best then suit the goals uh, and interests of uh, the Indigenous Post-Secondary Institute. And so they wanted something that was very community-based. And at the time we weren't you know, we didn't have the resources to be delivering programs in community, uh, but they were very adamant that, you know, it was to be community based and delivered in community, uh, looking for holistic features. So really building into our program uh, and, and elders program offering um, mentorship opportunities and that the program would center around Indigenous knowledges. So we really then had to look at uh, the syllabi that would then be offered in courses and start to look at um, making some revisions uh, and enhancements, certainly curriculum enhancements uh, to the course offerings. Um, so this was, this was a, a bit of a different process than just simply offering courses uh, related to the master's uh, program. Uh, it was also, I would say, in terms of the goals, very, it was Indigenous determined and driven, as I just described. Um, and the engagement was really from uh, the ground up. Um, when I think about uh, having to develop and build and design the program, you know, we really uh, were led by uh, the Nicola Valley Institute of Technology and the, the institute with whom we worked with, in that they were insistent it was Indigenous led. So normally a department or unit would deliver this program, and yet we operated as a partnership with the post secondary institution, um, uh, the Office of Indigenous Education, and the uh, department. Uh, that offers the, the MED taking part. So we were all part of the admissions process with our community partner joining us in that. Uh, hiring instructors, they were very insistent uh, that it would be uh, largely and if possibly all staffed by indigenous people. And that, that really worked against some of the policy uh, within the department and within our departments in that, of course, it, uh, faculty have priority to uh, teach in courses uh, that the institution or that we offer in the faculty. And so it was a bit of a shift in, in helping, uh, you know, department, the department head and others uh, as part of the unit uh, really think about working differently uh, with our Indigenous partners. And so I just want, I want to share with you a, a way of uh, in which I was summarizing uh, this co-construction as it related to our partnership. And I think well co this co-construction approach really challenged uh, the department practices, it really has resulted in stronger partnerships um, or in certainly stronger relationships uh, with community and impacts on our education that um, are part of our the work we do in the institution. And for us, it really gave us new ways of working um, to serve Indigenous communities. And so we were able to, uh, in thinking about community-based delivery, uh, start to look at other kinds of options and models face-to-face um, -to -face and then blended modes and how those might then work together. Uh, we've looked to create a subspecialized, uh, you know, we're looking to create subspecializations within our master's programming. So rather than creating these whole new degrees, how it is that we can use 
uh, the process of subspecializations then to be more responsive to Indigenous communities. And so currently we have an educational leadership, but we don't have an Indigenous educational leadership specialization. Um, same with spe uh, special education. Another area where we have um, high interest from Indigenous communities, um, and yet we don't have a, a whole degree centered around that. Uh, and so really looking at creating these special uh, sub-specializations within existing master's programs uh, to provide a more uh, to provide more sustained commitments to Indigenous uh, communities. And then finally, it really helped, uh, it really pushed us. It really pushed us to think about pathways um, to uh, pathways uh, towards um, uh, for Indigenous uh, learners uh, into the various programming. And so one, when we started to think about um, helping uh, learners be prepared for the master's program, we look to create a leadership experience. So we're, you know, looking at this, how can we create a, an, a summer institute whereby uh, we might offer to Indigenous communities and uh, participants from Indigenous communities with the goal that if students took part Part in this institute that they would then receive credit that would then be applied to their master's program if they were uh, then to move on into a master's program. So it, it starts to promote the pathway of graduate education, um, thinking about this kind of course or uh, that could be part of an institute. Um, and I think it also creates a lot of motivation knowing and, and, and also some preparation experiences um, in taking part in this kind of experience that provides a course that um, then counts towards their master's once they're uh, once they uh, enroll in a master's program. Uh, I, I think given my time, I, I would have talked a little bit about Indigenous teacher education, but uh, I, I'm, I'm mindful of the, uh, our time. So I want to move on to the uh, third, the final trickster strategy. Um, the final tr uh, trickster approach is the strategy of renewal. And so uh, Dr. Archibald, uh, who's developed a, a framework for storytelling for both research and practice, explains People keep the spirit of a story alive by telling it to others and by interacting with the story. In the so it's in the retelling of stories, meaning unfolds in relationship to personal lives. And it's with each um, retelling prompts new meaning as each person interprets the story. Uh, as Indigenous people, we need to continue to tell our stories, and we tell these stories in the interests of our intellectual, spiritual, and social traditions. However, it's in the, it's in the telling and retelling of stories, such as Coyote Takes Water uh, from the pro Frog People, that change and growth can occur. And so at the heart of Canada's um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission work or report are the stories of residential school survivors. Their stories are a testament to the resiliency of Indigenous peoples and their words, uh, which are the foundation uh, of the TRC work, their words restore the singular settler uh, version of history that circulates in our curriculum of schooling. Their stories speak uh, the truth of the colonial violence mediated through education, and we cannot lift our spirits, we cannot reconcile our past, nor be accountable to Indigenous learners and communities without this truth. And yet reconciliation has been critiqued as it continues to outpace the truth or equally troubling the colonial impulse to deny or distort this history, even at the highest levels uh, of government. We must continue to create spaces for Indigenous people to tell their survivor stories. And so while these stories are our legacy, they're also part of the renewal strategy as they help other stories needed, they help other stories needed um, to imagine and enact educational opportunities or initiatives and alternatives for Indigenous learners. And this is a, a side of the reconciliation box that had gathered um, <laughs> gathered um, significant items uh, from across Can as the as the uh, commission traveled across Canada. These items were kept in this box. So. 
If we are to dismantle oppressive uh, mechanisms of post-secondary institutions and create a framework that is uh, create a framework that is accountable to Indigenous communities, then Coyote's approach to renewal might look to the TRC's call to action 43, which calls upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to fully adopt and implement the United Nations declarations uh, um, on the rights of Indigenous peoples as a framework for reconciliation. Creating a new relation and political dynamic between higher education and Indigenous communities through the responsibility to advance human rights standards set out in UNDRIP Indigenous rights to education, language, and culture might then be explicitly linked to our rights over lands, resources, and knowledges, and hence the priorities of self-determination and sovereignty. If institutions um, of education uh, if, if institutions of education are to uh, be or need to be more knowledgeable uh, about the unique legal political status of Indigenous nations, and if they were more knowledgeable, they would be better, um, they would better understand Indigenous learners and their own responsibilities towards Indigenous education. So giving consideration to the roles and responsibilities towards um, Indigenous education through a rights-based approach, I want to draw your attention to UBC's new Indigenous Strategic Plan, which sets out eight goals and 43 commitments intended to integrate the rights of Indigenous peoples into every aspect of the university's work and operations. And here I want to share with you just some of the goals that have been identified uh, been identified uh, through a very extensive uh, consultation process, um, engaging the community, uh, the, the university community, the external community, uh, Indigenous folks, uh, students, uh, all levels uh, of uh, at the institution um, in determining uh, what these goals might then look like, as well as recommendations then uh, that accompany the, uh, accompany these. And so there are also uh, structures or, uh, that are supporting this uh, Indigenous strategic plan that include an implementation committee uh, who then organizes annual plans. Uh, and also what I'm presenting here, it's a performance measure framework that is being developed. Uh, and so what it does is it uh, describes the actions of the Indigenous strategic plans. And then it asks faculties of education, such as the faculty of education then to identify identify, you know, what are some of the outputs, so the products um, or services that are produced when action is then taken, uh, what are some of the outcomes that are both long and short term um, that if uh, 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 in, in relationship to, again, the actions described uh, in the plan and then the consequences from that action. Uh, and then it looks for various kinds of measures. So, you know, what are quantitative and qualitative measures? And so this is a, a, um, a process that we're going to be engaging in the Faculty of Education um, which will involve some mapping uh, of our activities and, and then looking for what are the opportunities then uh, that we can continue to enhance and build on uh, in the faculty so that we are responsive to uh, the Indigenous strategic plan. And so in my role, I'll be uh, working with others uh, to lead on this uh, process in the faculty. So I might liken the trickster technique of telling and retelling stories to the Indigenous pedagogy of echoing described by Kelly Johnson in her thesis on the Cheltenham traditional pedagogy. And she describes this notion, uh, she described what she describes as echoing. So echoing is an iterative pedag and, she, and I'm quoting here from her thesis, echoing as an iterative pedagogical tool involves repeating the teaching in various ways until learning takes root. Indigenous people want their stories to echo into the hearts and minds of students, faculty, administrators, and community who shape learning environments that serve Indigenous students. 
In the telling of Indigenous stories, in the telling of Indigenous stories comes great care to listen respectfully, make meaning, and act responsibly in our choices. And I want to bring uh, Coyote into the conversation, and I wanted to bring Coyote into the conversation tonight to show us how Indigenous stories can teach us about our collective responsibilities towards Indigenous education. And I want to conclude here with a quote from uh, Mi'kmaq scholar Marie Batiste, who tells us about the trickster. The trickster inspires us in life with their experiences, always learning and transforming with their learning, and being the inspiration for others in understanding the various bumps and bruises of life, as well as the great leaps of faith um, and change that come from making our choices. So miigwech. Thanks so much, Jen. It was a pleasure to hear uh, the metaphor of the trickster and how this plays out um, in your thinking for teacher education. And it's really quite instructive for all of us who are thinking about pathways um, through which we can, um, I'm not sure if the right word is decolonize the institution, but um, pathways for which um, we can provide Indigenous students um, opportunities um, for graduate, I'm thinking about graduate education, but all opportunities in teacher ed. So thanks so much. Um, there is a, there's a few questions coming in in the Q&A. And so just a reminder to the participants um, that please submit your questions um, into the Q&A section. And um, I'll definitely um, be attending to them and looking at them there. And also, um, um, Jan, just for uh, your benefit, but also to our participants who are here, I noticed in the chat, I, I can see people's names, and I noticed we have some residential school survivors and some elders with us tonight, so I just wanted to acknowledge their presence and welcome them here. So thank you for joining us. Um, one of the questions that's come up is around this idea of reconciliation, and I, and I think the trickster um, speaks to it a little bit, but the idea that reconciliation becomes a colonial project and how we can ensure that teacher education that is focused on reconciliation maintains its, its an in integrity or the, or the values of reconciliation. And I'm, I'm wondering what you're thinking about that. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not suggesting we do away with the reconciliation project, but I am thinking that we do need to make steps to, so we do need to make steps towards uh, moving beyond the reconciliation project. I mean, I think there's been a lot of uh, critique, if you will, around reconciliation. Um, but I mean, I, you know, I, I am certainly not saying to do away with it. I think it has been, uh, you, you know, really important to uh, raising that awareness of our, uh, you know, this shared colonial history. Um, you know, it has been really significant in um, uh, leading towards initiatives and, and opportunities within teacher education. I mean, you know, we think about required course instruction or what I think of as foundational course instruction. You know, that a lot of that has been mobilized uh, by, you know, the work of uh, the TRC and the calls to action. I think a lot of the curriculum um, things that we're seeing uh, within K-12 education, within teacher education, you know, have all been mobilized through directives, calls to action uh, of the TRC. So I think we do want to maintain um, the values, if you will, if you, you know, maintain the values um, associated with, with, with reconciliation and, and, and maintain those within our teacher education programs. But I think we really need to start to look beyond, um, you know, some of those goals uh, associated with reconciliation to consider uh, Indigenous priorities and how it is that we are using reconciliation to advance Indigenous priorities, to advance, you know, to advance Indigenous people's vision uh, of Indigenous education, and and what does it mean to serve Indigenous, you know, to help or to assist Indigenous students to you know serve their own communities, <laughs> and whether that's you know reserve communities, urban communities, and I think as uh, uh, faculties of education, we have that responsibility um, towards Indigenous learners and that accountability, as I was saying, to Indigenous communities. So I'm certainly not saying to do away 
uh, with reconciliation. But I think we need to move beyond the reconciliation project as a what I sometimes say, you know, feels like a settler gig. You know, this is something that it is. Um, you know, aimed at uh, engaging um, settlers into a conversation uh, about colonialism. And I, I think we need to also really consider, uh, you know, what are the aspirations uh, of Indigenous people uh, within post-secondary institution? And what is our responsibility uh, as, as faculties of education to support, you know, to support those um, priorities? Thanks, Jen. And, and related to that, then, um, when we think about teacher ed programs, uh, whether they be initial ed or master's programs, um, how important is it that these things occur in and with community? Uh, well, I love the idea. That's a great question because I love that you, the question asks, how do these things occur within community? And we know that um, when programs and initiatives are offered in community, uh, that we have a better success. Uh, sorry, we have better recruitment. We have better retention, uh, so less attrition, uh, and 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 more success in terms of allowing students to remain in in their communities. Um, so I think the idea of you know of being able to offer uh, programs in communities, uh, you know, has not it only creates opportunities for learners, but I mean it can have a real impact in in communities. And I think about our NITEP program here at uh, at UBC. You know, it, we've had a forty five year history of offering. Uh, offering teacher education in uh, communities, Indigenous communities around BC. And while, uh, you know, we've been able to offer the first three, four years of that program in community, our students often then have to uh, come to campus for their professional, what we, their professional certification year. And that is where we lose students. Some stu students who just may have, you know, the institution is just, it's too big, it's too colonial, it's, you know, all of these things. And so may choose not to stay, or sorry, may not to complete the program. And so we have been really successful in the last three years um, of offering the whole of our Bachelor of Education program in community. So in our Caribou region, uh, we have 16 uh, Indigenous teachers who we will graduate this year who did not have to transition to campus because we were able to offer the full of the four-year Bachelor of Education degree in community. Uh, when we offered to do this in the Bella Coola area to offer the full of our program in Bella Coola, we had 25 students register, 25 Indigenous students saying, yes, if we can stay in community, we want to be part of that. And part of our success in, the, in, in, the, in that has been we make these decisions early with community. So we've been doing, previously we would you know, we might put out an expression of interest and we would then, you know, spend time less than a year promoting our program. We now work over two years. So we develop a two year relationship with communities uh, before we begin our program. And that allows students to get ready for the program, whether it's credits they need, family responsibilities, uh, financial responsibilities. It demonstrates the university's commitment um, to being in community. It uh, builds our, it strengthens our partnerships uh, to deliver the whole of our program. But of course we know uh, that re it's the resources, right? It's the resources and costs of delivering community-based uh, programming. Uh, and so that's where I think as institutions, again, that's part of our accountability. Um, and so for, for me, uh, you know, as director of our NITEP program, I'm just so pleased to see um, the opportunities that delivering programs in community then can create. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, so powerful. 
Um, so then it, it begs a question, and this is coming up in the Q&A too, questions of curriculum then. Um, I know that in Manitoba, and I'm assuming it's the same in BC, that there's a number of requirements for teacher ed programs, um, whether that be pro provincially mandated when it comes to institutional structures in regards to graduate programs, there's all sorts of requirements. Um, lots of these could be considered oppressive and colonial structures that aren't supportive indi of Indigenous um, knowledge for sure, um, and also Indigenous ways of being. So could you give some examples perhaps of how um, either in the NITEP or in graduate programs um, you've tended to um, uh, Indigenous knowledge and maybe the tension between the colonial structures and expectations of governments and or institutions um, and how you've dealt with some of that? Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I think um, Indigenous programs such as uh, NITEP and I think the master's programs that we are developing specific for Indigenous communities and Indigenous learners, uh, you know, the focus um, is around Indigenous knowledge, centering of Indigenous knowledges and giving priority to Indigenous knowledges and pedagogies. And I think the biggest tension really, um, Melanie, is uh, around resourcing. You know, it's resourcing uh, the development of program, or sorry, development of the curriculum or enhancement of, of the curriculum, creating those courses. So how do we re adequately resource um, people to be able to, you know, develop and redesign and redevelop courses uh, <laughs> that give focus and attention to Indigenous knowledges or develop new courses that are specific to um, the indig Indigenous themes and uh, or Indigenous curriculum. So I think for us, really, the biggest tension um, is resources, uh, because our part of our success has been um, has been around um, the working uh, alongside the indigenous community and advocate and and working with them and having them support us in in the development uh, of development of our uh, curriculum so I, I, I think you know, we've been very successful in terms of uh, drawing on curriculum reform um, that's happening in BC. So when we think about um, in BC, the first people's principles of learning is informing the K to 12 curriculum. And so uh, we're also seeing uh, changing uh, standards for the profession, whereby educators, all educators uh, are going, you know, much like Alberta, uh, you know, developing, we've developed the ninth standard, what we call the ninth standard, which requires all teacher candidates to, or not teacher candidates, but all educators to be able to engage with Indigenous knowledges and histories and, and worldviews. And so I think those are uh, strategic kinds of mechanisms that then create a rationale uh, for us in teacher education <laughs> to be responsive um, to the changing uh, landscape, the changing policy landscape. And uh, so that's led to, uh, as well, to curriculum reform in teacher education. And I have to say, you know, we used to call it the required course in teacher education, and we've really we've tried to shift our language away from the required course um, more towards the foundational course. Mm. So the foundational, so just kind of changing some of our language um, in that coursework. And I have to say, you know, when we started, and I'm sure, you know, I'd be really interested to hear, you know, the experiences at the U of M around um, that kind of foundational coursework. But, you know, five to six years ago, when we initiated the course, we had lots of resistance, lots of resistance to a foundational course in a BEd program. And I have to say the work of reconciliation and the work of the TRC has really changed that. We now have students who talk about this course. This foundational course is probably the most profound course that they take in really helping them think about their teacher identities and helping them think about their responsibilities uh, as educators. So, you know, again, one of the uh, 
I, I think really valuable outcomes of the work of the TRC has been, um, you know, shifting uh, or, or building that awareness and knowledge for people so that when we're in these court, now mind you, we still have resistance. We still have people who are resistant to, um, in, you know, the role and the place of Indigenous knowledge. So there's still a lot of that decolonizing work um, that, that we need to do. But I feel just so much more hopeful um, in light of uh, some of the transformation that we are seeing in educators who take these courses. Thanks, Jen. And, and one of the things that that makes me think about too is um, in, in reference to these, these structures and the resource issue that you mentioned, um, how have you managed um, the resources? And I'm thinking here particularly about, about teachers for the programs. Um, I know at U of M and our faculty, we're trying to make an effort to hire more Indigenous peoples. But it seems to me that if we're doing work with community, then the community members need to be a part of the of the um, taking the roles of educators, uh, whether it be elders or knowledge keepers. How do, how within an institution do you work with community in that way so that they can take on a role of being educators within these programs? Um, and then I guess. It, you know, um, alongside that, how as colonial settlers who are allies, how do we support that work and not overburden our colleagues? Um, I, I just, I'm interested about that, those, those relationships. Um, yeah, um, you know, I think teaching uh, a foundational course in Indigenous education uh, really raised for us capacity <laughs> the issue of capacity, uh, you know, we simply don't have enough Indigenous faculty um, then to teach all the, you know, to teach these courses. Um, but also, we don't see it as, you know, the responsibility of only Indigenous faculty and Indigenous people to be teaching this course. Um, we know that uh, uh, we know that racialized gender uh, women and, and racialized faculty receive lower SCETs, lower teaching evaluation mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. school. And so that was really, a, that was a significant issue for us in the initial offerings uh, of this course. And so we uh, opened the course up to uh, ally and Indigenous uh, faculty teaching the course, as well as ally and Indigenous educators in, in the community uh, teaching the course. And that helped us with our capacity, um, the issues of around capacity, but it also helped uh, uh, non-Indigenous teacher candidates see uh, non-Indigenous people model um, the practices of Indigenous education. And so that was really important. Another initiative that we, uh, that I engaged in through uh, uh, teaching learning enhancement fund grant, so grants that are offered for teaching uh, to enhance teaching, um, was one of a, a co-teaching design whereby, you know, we, we would bring in, um, we would invite instructors uh, across the faculty, not just in our uh, foundational course, but across the faculty. We invited them into a mentoring program and we said, hey, you know, become part of this mentoring program and we'll uh, have you co-teach with Indigenous knowledge keepers and elders or community members as part of, uh, you know, contributing to, contributing to your uh, classroom uh, instruction. And curriculum, and we had few instructors take it up. Um, and we had, you know, model. We had designed a program whereby, you know, the instructor had to meet with the uh, indigenous knowledge keeper or elder community member. They had to plan together, uh, and we were we compensated adequately our indigenous um, community participation. But you know, they had to plan together. We wondered what it would look like to co-teach together. We asked them to debrief the experience then together. Uh, what did they learn from it? So this was really about enhancing the enhance, enhancing curriculum across teacher education, as well as giving many of our faculty some, some confidence in engaging with Indigenous community and Indigenous knowledges. And, and, you know, it was disappointing we didn't have the take up that we had really uh, hoped for um, because our indigenous community members, our elders, our knowledge keepers and, and educators, you know, they bring such rich knowledge 
uh, and, and, and that's so appreciated by students, uh, you know, and, and they bring that to the classroom. And so, you know, we talk a lot about building the confidence uh, uh, and knowledge and experience of teacher candidates, but we still have a lot of work to do in terms of professional development for teacher educators mm -hmm. um, who work in our program. And so, you know, I, I think that we, we have professional development responsibilities um, that we need to uh, engage in. And we do that in our faculty through, we've been trying different kinds of activities uh, in which to do that. We have a a pedagogy circle whereby we invite all the faculty in and we share different ways of um, integrating Indigenous perspectives into the curriculum. We've done some role playing. We've worked with a theater, um, a research theater group uh, in our faculty and then, you know, presented various scenarios for teaching so that people could really see how to uh, moder you know, mediate and uh, address really difficult kinds of conversations uh, in the classroom. Again, building that confidence of our instructors uh, to engage with Indigenous histories, um, worldviews and perspectives. Um, so we've done, uh, uh, took that, we've taken that approach. Uh, we've tried a summer, like, like a small institute, a three-day institute whereby, you know, and I think that's probably the most transformative uh, was to engage uh, Indigenous, uh, sorry, to engage uh, our faculty in a more intensive kind of experience where they're actually, you know, we went to the Musqueam community, uh, we had visited with the Musqueam community members, they talked about their history. So it really was, um, it really allowed them to make connections to community that we talk about is so critical in, in relationships. And I think once they develop that that knowledge and, and experience, they become much more comfortable in reaching out to the Indigenous uh, community. Uh, we're also looking to create a position, a, a, Musque what we, a Musqueam liaison position. So this is uh, a member of Mus. we would employ a member of Musqueam uh, who would then work with our faculty around local knowledge, local histories, um, and ways that that could then be integrated uh, into our program. Because I, I, for us, I don't think we do enough around uh, working with local community. But again, we have to be mindful of the kinds of um, pressures that that places. When we say, you know, we need to uh, work with Indigenous communities in the development of curriculum and programs, we, we have to be really mindful of the kinds of uh, demands that we place uh, on our Indigenous um, community members, like the demands on our elders, um, you know, who are, you know, I, someone said, our elders are getting so thin. Um, and it's because we place so many demands on them, you know, requests, you know, for uh, to come and be part of curriculum development and teaching and acknowledgements and meeting with students and elders and residents. And, and these are such important uh, initiatives and such important contributions uh, that they make. But, you know, it, it's a lot of it's a lot of um, they carry a lot. They continue they continue to carry a lot of our burden uh, in the, in the institution. And so what, you know, what are we doing about that? Yeah, it's a great question and, and illustrates um, their value uh, so much, you know, there's so much to contribute, but also the demands are, are so great. Um, it's something to be mindful of for sure. Um, there's a question in the chat in regards to um, blended learning and online learning. Um, and, you know, I think COVID's shown us uh, on the one hand, you know, this could be an opportunity for students who are far flung, who are maybe far away from universities, um, who maybe can't get to communities where programming is offered. Um, but it also has absolutely magnified inequities in our system, whether it be access to Wi-Fi technology, um, the privileging of, of even this kind of, of pedagogy, if you will. Um, so what are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on um, blended or online um, programming for uh, teacher ed programs, Indigenous teacher ed programs? And, and yeah, and, and that's something we're really thinking about, um, you know, how it is that we can, uh, you know, use blended learning modes uh, to create uh, greater accessibility. Uh, 
in indigenous teacher education, but I, I think as well as in, in, in teacher education uh, it, itself. And I think it creates um, really uh, great opportunities, um, you know, but all, you know, all, I think there needs to be a lot of pieces that are in play um, and supporting structures and some protocols and uh, processes and relationships that, uh, that are in play around uh, these blended learning opportunities. And, and so it is about, uh, you know, being responsive to communities. So um, I, as I described the masters of indigenous education that we co-constructed with um, our indigenous partner, they were really clear to us, you know, at the outset, no, we, we don't want uh, blended learning. Sorry, we don't want online learning. We want face-to-face. -face. That's how our community members learn best. And that's what we want. And it was the COVID that really, you know, sort of uh, made that much, it made that very challenging. And, and we just weren't able to offer it in that way, which was fine because, you know, every, we were all um, working under the uh, the strain of, of COVID. Um, but some of our communities are very adamant that they do want the face-to-face -face and, and the blended is not an option. So I think we have to, again, it's about being responsive uh, to community contexts. Uh, but I think it's also too, it's created uh, some wonderful uh, learning opportunities. Like we, we talk, we uh, in our program talk about, you know, how can we represent Indigenous knowledges in an online space? And how do we do that in really respectful kinds of ways? So we talk about, um, you know, the kinds of knowledge um, that we bring into the space and, and what's appropriate then uh, to share. And we have lots of conversations about that um, in terms of, um, you know, ceremonial knowledge that might come into the space. And, you know, is that, a, you know, is that appropriate um, a question? And so that, uh, so a lot of this requires, I think, a lot more conversation. Uh, we need to deepen our relationships um, a, a around um, using blended learning and using, uh, you know, these remote learning, online learning as a way in which to share Indigenous knowledges and engage uh, Indigenous learners. I mean, there, and, and I mean, there are just limitations to it. And how, how do those um, come up against the opportunities uh, then it creates? So for us, it's contextual. So we work with community uh, to determine what are the, you know, what are their preferences? What are the options? Because um, right now we're in remote communities where our students don't like, you know, access to stable Wi-Fi is a challenge. Some of them have to drive into, you know, the Tim Hortons in town just to download their thing, you know, download their materials. Uh, they're so Zoom fatigued. So we've actually been, you know, we sent hard copies. Uh, you know, we we sent the, all our reading packages to Staples for them to pick up in, you know, in a, in a local community uh, because they simply just don't want to be online uh, all day. Um, we it's limited the kind of the elders that we've been able to involve because many of our elders, you know, may not have access or familiarity to working with technology. Um, so, you know, it's, it's created some limitations uh, for our program in that way. So I see it as really context specific um, in, in terms of the, the use of online or, or blended learning. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, there's no easy answers to any of this work. Um, I'm going to try to um, collapse a couple of uh, other questions that are coming in around um, the, the mixed culture of, of Indigenous populations, you know, some are coming from urban settings, some are coming from rural settings, um, some are experiencing culture shock when they're coming to campuses. Um, and someone else is also asking in that same regard, perhaps, um, that a lot of our education students are coming um, from campuses already, given that they have to have a previous degree. So we've got a, a lot of students who are coming from arts and sciences. Um, urban and rural. So what's your sense of the movement uh, forward, perhaps, um, to a better shared future in university spaces? Uh, I guess for me, it's um, a way forward is that we need to think holistically 
uh, about the supports and or, or thinking about the students, um, you know, thinking about the Indigenous students who come come to our institutions, um, you know, what kind of learning environments and uh, are we creating, what kinds of supports and resources uh, are we offering uh, for students to, um, to feel um, I'm going to say success is not the right word because when our indigenous students, you know, success to many, to success to perhaps, you, you know, uh, their ideas of success are very probably different from that of other students. Um, for us, uh, you know, success isn't tied to the academic, you know, it's not tied to I'm getting really great grades. Um, success is often tied to well being, it's tied to service, you know, being of service to their community. Um, it's tied to different sets of goals and aspirations. Um, you know, for many of our students, our, certainly for our Indigenous teachers, um, it's about transforming the uh, education space so it's better for Indigenous students that uh, are coming forward. You know, they're really trying to make a, a better place um, for Indigenous, you know, those Indigenous students who are coming up. Uh, behind them in, in K to 12, they want their, they want education to be a better place for than it was uh, for them. So I think part of you know moving moving forward is about rec recognizing uh, the different aspirations and the different goals. Um, just to assume that you know becoming a teacher for an Indigenous student is not the same as you know becoming a teacher for uh, say other other students, uh, non-Indigenous students. You know, some of them want to be teachers. You know, it's something they've wanted to do all their life. Uh, sorry, non-Indigenous students. You know, I've wanted to do this all my life. It's been in my family. Everybody in my family was a teacher. You know, you just hear these different kinds of motivations, and the motivations for our Indigenous students are, are often very different. And as a result, we need to be we need to respond differently. And so we need to be providing different kinds of what I think of our program um, services. Um, that are specific to the needs of our Indigenous students. Um, and so our services really focus on that no, the notion of well-being um, and, and working to provide, um, you know, we have wellness peers, we have Thrive Thursdays, um, and a lot of what we do around professional development for our Indigenous teachers isn't in the framework of professional development. It's in the, the framework of well-being. You know, mm -hmm. being, uh, you know, a strong uh, Indigenous educator is about having a strong sense of identity and who you are and what you bring to the classroom. Um, our students face racism. Uh, you know, they go into practicum they, you know, they go into practicum experiences in small communities, uh, urban communities, and you know, they come up against uh, a faculty associates and school sponsors who don't know how to evaluate and assess. Um, the integration of Indigenous perspectives. Uh, we've had Indigenous students told, you know, oh, oh no, don't, you know, don't focus on, on your, you know, Indigenous uh, content or Indigenous themes. Mm. You know, so it's about, what I, Michelle Pigeon, I really like her work. She talks about nurturing the gift, right? And, and that's what, how we see uh, supporting our, our Indigenous students. It is about nurturing their gifts, um, you know, the, the experiences, the worldviews then that, that they bring um, and, and focusing on their well-being and um, and their goals and, and aspirations. So it's for me, it's really about thinking, uh, thinking much more holistically um, for our Indigenous students. Yeah, lovely. That idea of nurturing gifts is a really uh compelling idea for sure and something we should be doing a better job of for all students um, in K-12. Um, I'm just mindful of the time and I'll end with a really quick short question and, and a small plug for the MOOC but when does the online uh, open access course start? There's a, a couple of questions in the chat from people who are interested. Oh, miigwech uh, for that interest. Uh, <laughs> oh, so, yes. Um, we, we, of course, the shift to online has made things really challenging in terms of all our resources being pulled to moving every course online. So uh, we are looking to offer uh, in May 
um, offer the course uh, in May, uh, but also creating other MOOCs. So uh, a MOOC in Indigenous Early Childhood, a MOOC that focuses on K-12. to So these are uh, things that we uh, are currently working on and planning. So opportunities to see, uh, to see other MOOCs. So yes, miigwech for that question. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jen. And maybe on that note, it's um, it's time to say good night. Um, thank you to all of our attendees for being here, um, for all of the wonderful questions in the chat. And thank you so much, Jen, um, for being in conversation with me and for sharing with us your trickster stories, because it certainly has been a pleasure for me. So thank you so much, Miigwech. Okay. Bye, my Pete.